Hello, good morning. My name is Andrzej Mirtes. I'm from Prague, Czech Republic, and I'm here to show you uh, how you can start using WebSockets and why I think they are awesome. Uh, anyone here already uses them? Okay, two hands up. <laughs> uh, but first, uh, I would like to show you that the traditional LAMP stack, that means Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP, uh, is boring and in some cases even inefficient. Uh, as you can see on the slide, I think that the LAMP stack is boring because um, you can use much broader set of technologies to your advantage and your user's comfort and also to lower your monthly hosting bill. Uh, you can only benefit if you apply the right technology to the right problem and not only limit yourself to uh, these four technologies. Just don't be afraid to try them out and use them. Uh, I'm a big fan of modern technologies that fit the solved problem better. And today I will mention most of them, but I will focus mainly on WebSockets. If you are interested in learning about RabbitMQ, you can attend my second talk, which is tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. also in this room. Okay, so who recognizes this situation? <laughs> uh, this is a screenshot of Google Chrome Web Developer Tools, and the inspected web page is doing the, sa the same AJAX, AJAX requests over and over, checking if there's something new to show to the user every few seconds. Uh, if I draw this situation on a timeline, it looks like this. The uh, blue lines are the check requests that I showed you on previous slide. And when uh, something interesting happens that your users might be interested in, that's the red line, the, user are, the users are notified about it much later in the next, next check request. This, uh, this approach is called polling and it means periodical updates. It's the same thing that, for example, uh, your email client uses when it checks uh, new emails. So uh, you don't know about the thing right away, but you have to wait until the next check request. So that introduces delay of half of the interval on average. So the user waits unnecessarily long time to see the update. That's an awful lot of time, half, half of the interval on average. It, this approach also causes unnecessary server strain because you have to build and check the state uh, from the clean slate every time. You have to do all the SQL queries and check everything from the clean slate. It also transfers too much data between the browser and the client, which is especially bad in the case of mobile devices. So you can uh, make the interval shorter, so the user waits less, but it also makes the other problems worse because you transfer more data and you put unnecessary load on your servers more. Mm. Much better approach and the right solution to this is the push principle. Uh, you leave the waiting completely out of the picture and everything happens as a reaction to the event. So when something happens, you immediately send the information from the first client to the server, the server processes it, and it sends the information to the other clients, to the other users immediately. So this whole timeline can happen in tens of milliseconds usually. It also, uh, it depends also on the delays between the clients and the servers, but it is much faster and there's no waiting introduced here. So your users know about the thing immediately, instantly. Uh, you can achieve this on the web using uh, WebSockets in modern browsers. They are implemented over TCP IP connection. It's not on HTTP. And when you uh, start the connection, there's a connection upgrade handshake at the beginning. If you ever wondered what the HTTP status code one-on-one -on -one switching protocols is for, this is it. If you, want, if you start on HTTP but you want to use another protocol, you use connection upgrade handshake over HTTP 101. 
uh, WebSockets are not uh, request response based protocol, but they are two way stream. The client produces uh, events for the server and the server produces events for the client. So each other has to, has to uh, react to each other's events. So these events can happen even in, in out of order. So for example, if uh, the client sends two messages to the server and the server replies, the client has no idea to which one message the server replied because it's an endless stream of events and there's no request response like in the traditional HTTP sense. Uh, that's also the reason why you should implement optimistic user interface. That means that when user initiates an action, for example, if he presses the button, you should let him immediately know that uh, the action happened. You don't have to wait for the server. Only if something bad happens, like the connection is interrupted, you let the user know about the error. But otherwise, you can be quite optimistic in your UI and uh, let everything happen from the point of the view of the user that everything is instant. Okay. Uh, don't f also, you shouldn't forget about that the WebSockets are not only uh, web technology. This is a prototype I made uh, in half an hour, and it shows a communication between web application and a mobile native application in iOS. Uh, there is a server between the scenes that uh, forwards the messages between, between the clients. But as you can see, um, it's, no, it's not a problem to uh, communicate between different technologies using WebSockets. It's only a matter of an implementation and there's a lot of libraries for a lot of platforms. Okay, before uh, we dive into implementation details of WebSockets and PHP, I would like to show you a few cool things I implemented with it. First thing, a few years ago, was a ticketing system for uh, booking theater seats or cinema seats. And actually, the first version wasn't implemented in WebSockets. It was implemented using the traditional AJAX approach, checking the server every few seconds. And it worked fine for the first couple of weeks. But when the first big pre-orders for some big musical happened, it crashed the server under the, under the big load from all the clients asking every few seconds if there's something new. So I uh, re-implemented this application in WebSockets. It took me a few weeks, but it was worth it because everything is much more efficient. It works without a problem. There are no conflicts uh, between, the, between the users booking the same seats. It works really well. And it was so cool that we actually used to play tic-tac-toe in the office with the first prototype. <laughs> okay, uh, another thing I implemented with WebSockets is what I like to call my most used mobile app. It's running on a stand next to my computer every time I'm at the office, and I use it to monitor error logs of our application. Uh, because we use multiple servers and uh, paper trail, aggregates the error logs into one into one place. Paper Trail is a third party application and it does not provide a stream API. Actually what all other clients of Paper Trail uses is the same uh, get request endpoint that checks the server every few seconds if there's something new. But I think it wasn't good enough for my mobile application because of the limited battery and performance. So I, re I put uh, my, my own server in React PHP between the Paper Trail API and my application, translating the periodic GET requests into WebSocket stream. Um, so it has two parts. It has the native, native iOS app and the React PHP backend, which consists of a few, few hundred lines, translating the periodical GET requests into uh, WebSocket's event stream. Okay, and last but not least, I implemented a simple extension of our administration in my current company that shows that uh, someone else is editing the same web page. So you can be more careful 
so that you don't override each other's changes. And it was an additional challenge because our application runs on multiple servers, so I had to solve horizontal scaling between them. So when a, one user connects to one server and another user connects to another server, they can see each other. So the servers are not only talking by WebSockets uh, to the browsers, but also between themselves uh, forwarding messages. Okay. Uh, WebSockets in PHP take the form of a long-running process. So if you hear PHP and long-running process in the same sentence, you might freak out. <laughs> but uh, let me show you. PHP is ready for long-running processes. Uh, there's a tweet from Chris Bowden, uh, which is a quite popular and famous developer that does all, a lot of interesting stuff with PHP. And he says that he had a server, WebSocket server running since 2014, and he had to uh, restart it after two years because of an upgrade. So that's quite solid, I think. So uh, memory leaks do not happen anymore in PHP. In PHP 5.6 and PHP 7, uh, they do not happen because of language fault, but if you have memory leaks, it's probably your fault. Because uh, to be able to run the process for a long time, without restarts requires more discipline and also thinking about memory allocation. So if you allocate some memory, if you create some objects, uh, you should unset them if you no longer need them so the memory can be reused for something else. So for example, uh, if you have doctrine identity map, who, who uses doctrine here? Okay, a lot of hands up. Uh, if you use Doctrine, uh, you have something called Identity Map, which is basically an in-memory cache of loaded entities into the application. So if you have a long-running process and you load entities via Doctrine, uh, your Identity Map gets bigger and bigger over time. So uh, you either can restart the process uh, every, every few minutes or every few hours, or you can be more careful about memory allocation and uh, clear the identity map regularly, or do not use Doctrine at all in your WebSockets application. Okay, uh, what's also important is asynchronous processing. Um, I would like to do a little introduction of it because it's an important part of implementing WebSockets server properly. Uh, PHP is single-threaded, but it is skill, but it is still capable of asynchronous processing uh, because the waiting. Waiting doesn't happen in PHP, but outside in the operating system. So uh, the main advantage of asynchronous processing is um, I, usually, I usually compare it to cooking, because when you are cooking and you put the water to boil, it would be silly to wait for the water to boil and then do something else, but like cut the audience. But that's exactly what you do in traditional PHP application. You send a SQL query and you wait for the, for the database to respond, but your PHP process is idling. It doesn't do anything, anything useful. But with asynchronous processing, you can send the SQL query and do some other computations, and when the SQL responds to the SQL data come back, uh, you can react to them. So you can uh, do asynchronously a lot of things like HTTP requests, SQL queries, file system access, and the main, the main thing, the core of asynchronous programming in, in a lot of languages is event loop. It has two alternating phases. It is either waiting for events or it is handling events. And uh, it is also possible in vanilla PHP using stream select function that is available everywhere. But there are also more Performant extensions too, and like like lib event, and there are also available abstraction libraries like React PHP because using the stream select code uh, direct stream select function directly uh, doesn't result in a pretty code. It's quite hairy and obfuscated, but uh, this still happens on one thread. There are no multiple processor cores uh, involved in this. 
and also uh, if you work in JavaScript, JavaScript works the same way in the browser and also on the server in Node.js. There is one thread and there is event loop that has two phases, waiting and handling. Okay. Uh, what you should be aware of is are blocking functions. You should you should avoid avoid them in your asynchronous code. Uh, blocking function is something that stops the execution of the thread. So this is the traditional MySQL query or a traditional uh, QRL, QRL call, call to some HTTP service or a sleep call that causes the thread to wait and not doing anything else. So uh, the processing slows down because if you uh, do a blocking method call based on the first request, the two other requests do not get started handling before the first blocking call is ended. So everything, everything slows down, the processing sl slows down, and the user waits uh, unnecessarily long time if you have a lot of requests coming in. So the better approach is to have everything, every input and output non-blocking. So the final timeline looks like this. The requests can be handled even in out of order and the event loop is in control of the flow of the application, and the PHP process is still doing something useful and doesn't wait all the time. So in the end, you need less PHP processes running, you need less servers, and you save money. And it's also a form of parallelization, because you can, if you uh, are interested in the results of multiple queries and then do something, on, do something with them, you can uh, fire all the queries at once and wait for the results of, of all of them. You don't have to do one and wait, do the second and wait, and do something useful. You can fire them at all, all at the same time. Okay, do we understand each other? Okay, so uh, this is how asynchronous code looks like. Um, when you uh, send a query to a database, you don't have the result right away, but you get what I call a promise, promise object. And if you are interested in the result of the query, you can call then on the promise object and pass a callback, which is called uh, when the query uh, of the database gets back. And uh, as you can see, I do an HTTP, HTTP request based on, the, based on the result of the database query, and then I send something uh, to the WebSocket, WebSocket client. So when you first look at the code like this, it can be quite counterintuitive, because the first thing that is called in this, in this code is the last line, it's echo, because the then callbacks are called at the next uh, loop tick at the air list. It's not called immediately. It's called when the next phase of the event loop happens at the air list. Okay. Uh, so there are multiple libraries available to implement a WebSocket server, but my favorite one is Ratchet by already mentioned Chris Bowden. It works with PHP, so it enables asynchronous code and you can install it with Composer. Everybody here uses Composer? I hope so, I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> cool. <laughs> I won't reply to that. <laughs> okay, so uh, the initial setup looks quite complex, but uh, you have to write this code only once at the beginning of the development. You uh, have to set up the server to be working correctly. So the first line is the mentioned event loop, and you have to bind the server to a certain port, which is listening on, and to a certain IP address. If you don't care about the IP address, you can just pass four zeros to the, as the second parameter. And the uh, dollar app uh, shown in the middle is actually an instance of your application. It's important to note that the last line, the loop run, uh, blocks the whole thread, so nothing gets executed after it, but because it's in the control of the whole process. And uh, 
there's one upside to React PHP. That's uh, when the request comes, the React PHP server is already running, so there's no delay uh, parsing the source code and bootstrapping the application. It happens quite immediately, like you can be used to when running a Java server because Java application also already running when the request comes. So this is a great uh, performance advantage of React PHP because there's no delay processing uh, the source code of your application. Every, everything is already running. Okay, so uh, if you want to implement a WebSocket server, you have to implement this interface. It's quite straightforward. You have an on open method and on close method, which are called uh, when a client connects to your server. But when the client connects, uh, you still don't know anything about it because the client didn't send you any data. Uh, you have to wait until the first message of the client to tell you what he's, what he's interested in, like what chat room he wants to join or war, what event he wants to, he wants to book, etc. And uh, this interface is something like a controller. So as you probably know, uh, you shouldn't make fed controllers. Your main business logic should be somewhere else to be reusable, to uh, result in more clean code. So uh, just put the bare minimum code here in this object and put everything else uh, somewhere else where it can be unit tested and and so on. Okay, so I would like to show you how to implement a simple um, chat application. Uh, when a client connects, you should store its object to some array or some storage. I like to use uh, SPL object storage because it enables me to easily remove uh, the object based on its identity, so I don't have to track which index in an array it has. I just I can just call uh, SPL object storage detach and the object is removed from the storage, which is not the case in uh, common arrays. Okay, uh, so this is how you should react to an incoming message. You should uh, iterate over all connected clients and you should, send, you should send them the message. And also you shouldn't send the message to the original author because uh, it doesn't make sense to show him the same message that he just sent, so I exclude him from forwarding uh, the messages. And as I already tried to, to, to tell you, uh, you should uh, avoid blocking functions, so uh, functionality that depends on incoming messages should be asynchronous in order not to block the server. So everything like sending HTTP requests, creating rapid MQ messages, doing SQL queries uh, should be non-blocking. So you can react on, uh, so you can react to next uh, incoming requests. But uh, asynchronous stuff is also uh, more complex because you have to take into account that anything can happen between the request is sent and the response is received. So if a client tells you that he's interested in something and you send an asynchronous query to a database, so when the result comes back, the client might no longer be there. He might no longer be interested in the message. So you have to think about all the consequences and all the conditions, all the situations that can happen between sending the query and receiving receiving the query. So, and also with asynchronous programming, you should think about what would happen if some two things uh, happened in a different order. So, even if it's if it's not probable, you should think about what would happen if something happened in a different order or if it's delayed, etc. Because even if even with low probability, it it can happen. It will happen. Okay, so I have a tip for you about uh, debugging. So when you usually debug your code, you put a var dump, var dump variable in your code, but uh, that's not very useful because uh, before you deploy that code to production, you have to remove, you, you have to remove uh, those lines. But if you use something like monoc, 
you can leave those lines there and they can be still useful in, even in production when you need to debug some issue that your user encountered. Uh, so uh, when you are developing the application, I recommend uh, configuring monologue to output uh, your debug calls on the, uh, on the command line interface in the terminal and before you deploy your uh, application to production, you should reconfigure it to lock those things somewhere else, for example, like in a file on in paper trail or some service like that. So you don't have to change your code at all, you change only the configuration and those uh, logging lines can still be left in your code and nothing bad happens. Uh, event loops also support timers. Timers are an asynchronous non-blocking alternative to sleep. So you can use them to implement um, something like tracking inactivity or uh, use it to expire stuff, etc. So for example, when a user clicks on a seat, I tell the server that he's interested in the seat, but if nothing else doesn't, if nothing else happens for the next 15 minutes, I automatically uh, unbook him, his his seat before, uh, in case he didn't he didn't buy it. Uh, it's also important to note that timers are not precise; they can happen a little bit later because they also have to wait for the next event loop, event loop, uh, waiting for events phase. And also, uh, you have to you have to count the possibility of a process crash. So if your timers are important to you, you should also persist them in some storage like, like Redis. So you can recover the timers next time your process uh, restarts. Because timers are not persistent, they are, they, uh, are removed when the process crashes. So if they are important to you, you should uh, persist them and restore them later. Mm. WebSocket server is running in a different model than a traditional PHP application. It doesn't use PHP FPM. It hand one process handles all the requests at the same time. So that means that global variables like dollar session or dollar get are not useful in this situation because uh, multiple, multiple clients connect at the same time and there's nothing useful you can fill those global, global arrays with. So if you need to use sessions, you have to use another approach. Um, you should have some uh, common storage of your sessions that is used across uh, your classic HTTP application and your WebSockets application. So you need to abstract session storage and uh, because, because session data are connection specific. So this is solved by a uh, ratchet, ratchet uh, session provider in case you use Symfony. So this is already solved for you if you use Symfony, but if you use another framework or your own, you have to solve it your way and you cannot use a uh, dollar session anymore. Um, if you don't need sessions and you want to authenticate your user, you can use a stateless API approach, like you can be used to when uh, writing a RESTful API, because in RESTful API, you don't send any cookies and you're authenticating based on uh, some user tokens. So uh, you can either use sessions and send a cookie with PHP session ID, or you can send a token in the URL of every, every connection to the WebSocket server, like a RESTful API approach. Okay, uh, when something happens in the classic big uh, web application and you need to notify the WebSockets clients about it, uh, you have to have some communication between the WebSockets process and your uh, web server, your PHP FPM. So uh, I like to use message queues for that, so you can, you can use RabbitMQ, 
you can use uh, zero MQ, anything that uh, provides inter-process communication uh, between processes on the server. So, for example, when uh, your Symfony controller is called and you need uh, your WebSockets clients not uh, notify them about something, you can send a message to RabbitMQ, it, RabbitMQ forwards it to the WebSocket server and you can send a message to the client. Mm. When you have a process running on your server, you should do something about keeping it alive because although uh, Chris Bowden manages to run processes for two years, your process can crash quite often because of a memory limit, because of some exception, because anything can go wrong. So you need something to keep your processes alive. I like to use a supervisor, supervisor for that. Supervisor is a utility written in Python and it monitors and restarts processes. It acts as it acts like the parent on the on the server. The, your processes are children of the supervisory process. Uh, you also shouldn't forget to restart your process when you are deploying uh, some code changes. Because if you don't restart it, uh, you, are, you still have running uh, an old version of your code, so uh, you should restart it. And also, uh, you should implement PC and TL signal to handle kill signals, because uh, if you don't implement it and the process is sent a kill signal, kill signal is if you, are, if you have a running command in your terminal and you press Control C to uh, end it, that's a kill signal. So if you don't implement one in PHP, the process is killed immediately. But with supervisor, it can leave your process running for something like 30 seconds, so you can finish your useful work and end on your own terms. So if you haven't finished yet, you can finish your work, then stop the event, then stop the event loop, and finish gracefully if you implement PCNTL signal. Okay, um, you can provide access to your server directly, but it will probably run on some exotic port because uh, traditional ports like 80 or 443 will be occupied by your web server. So you will have to run your server on some port like 8080. But these exotic ports are usually blocked in corporate environments. So you will uh, leave a lot of users without the possibility of using your application if uh, you will only access it on some exotic port. So uh, you can use Nginx or Apache, you can use your web server as a proxy and uh, provide access to your WebSocket server through, through it. And also, uh, Ratchet does not support HTTPS, but it can be solved by Nginx. Nginx can do the uh, secure handshake, check the certificate and send a pure, clean uh, HTTP stream to your Ratchet application. So this is, this is how you configure your Nginx to act as a proxy. You have to define an upstream and tell Nginx on which port your WebSockets server is running. And if you have the upstream, you have to define a URL, you have to define a location of your application and it's a, bi it's a bunch of lines that you have to put in your configuration, but I think the most important uh, one is the last one because uh, I struggled to find that with proxy buffering on, the WebSocket server doesn't run very well. It sometimes work, works, but sometimes it doesn't. So you have to turn the proxy buffering off and the Nginx forwards everything to Ratchet immediately, so it works very well, okay? Um, sometimes one process is not enough because if you have a lot of users, uh, one process can't handle them all. Um, there's a limit on number of connections, it's in order of thousands, and 
if you have multiple servers, you also have to put multiple server processes on each each server to be able to provide communication between the clients on each server. So, and it, if one process uh, becomes too congested, you have to time, you have to, it's, you have to add another one. Um, so, these servers have to communicate with each, with each other because when one client connects to uh, one server, um, another client on another server might be interested in what the first client has to say. So the servers, the processes can communicate between each other also by using message queues like uh, RabbitMQ or ZeroMQ. Okay, so finally, we are getting to the client side. Um, this is how browser support looks like. In Poland, it's almost 95%, so I think it's pretty safe to uh, use WebSockets. Um, if you are concerned about Internet Explorer, it's supported in Internet Explorer 10 and 11. Uh, 9 and lower don't support WebSockets, but uh, you still can use them, but uh, you have to you have to work around the fact that these browsers do not support it directly. I will talk about it later. So anyway, you should. Uh, this is how you should detect support of uh, WebSockets in your application on the client side. It's better to detect it like this to check for an, uh, available features on your window object then maintaining a table of supported browsers and versions because that's quite tedious and uh, it's very difficult to maintain which browsers currently support WebSockets and check for the user agent or whatever. It's better to uh, check it like this. Mm, so this is how you initiate a connection on the client side. Be aware of the fact that uh, calling constructor of the WebSockets object uh, already connects the client, so there's no connect method. Uh, the client is connected when you call the constructor. Mm. On the other hand, uh, there's no limit uh, on cross-origin cross -origin communication. Cross, there's no cross-origin restriction like in AJAX, because in, a, in the browser, the WebSockets can connect to any host. And the browser sends an uh, origin header to, to be checked by your server. So if you want to uh, interrupt any connections from other hosts, you can do it on your server. But the browser uh, does not limit where you can connect to. Uh, WSS is secure encrypted variant. If you can, you should use it. And if your website is on HTTP, you can connect either to WS or to WSS, but if you are already on HTTPS, you can connect only to the secure variant, only to the second line. Mm. The API on uh, the client looks very similar to uh, the server. You also have on open and on error callbacks and on message callback when you can react to uh, your server's messages. And if you want to send a message to the server, you can use method send. It's really, really straightforward. Okay. You should also note that users uh, can go offline and come back online at any time, especially on mobile devices and desktop computers with flaky connections. So you should check and you should implement reconnecting. This is the uh, simplest, simplest variant, most naive implementation. So you can probably improve it by presenting uh, to the user the fact that the connection is offline, or maybe prolonging the interval between each connection, like Gmail does, because Gmail tries to reconnect to the server after one second, if it fails after five seconds, if it fails after one minute, etc. Because it's really improbable that the connection will succeed if there are multiple failed attempts before. Mm. Who uses content security policy, CSP? No one. So 
that's quite a new thing. Uh, you can use it to harden the security of your web applications. Um, it's in a header, so content security policy, and it's essentially whitelisting what the browser uh, can do with your application. So you can limit stuff like uh, cross-site scripting and flash if someone injects code in your application. So if you, if you use it, you can allow connecting to your uh, WebSocket server with uh, this, this header. Um, if you know CSP, you may be wondering why you can't use connect source self, um, which references your own server. You cannot use that because self also contains the protocol, the scheme, which is, which is either HTTP or HTTPS. So if you are working with sockets, you cannot use uh, that protocol, so you can't use self. So you have to write uh, your host even if you are on the same server. Okay, we are almost finished. <laughs> um, until now, we've talked about the web browser as a WebSockets web client, but you can also use uh, PHP as the client. But you may be wondering what for. So there are several useful uh, use cases for that. Uh, you can also use a library written by Chris Bowden. It's called Powell. And you can use it to write uh, functional tests. Here, uh, write functional tests or integration tests in PHP unit. OK, so you are probably used to making uh, HTTP requests to your, own, to your own application to check if everything's were fine. So if you are writing a WebSockets application, you can also write tests using the WebSockets PHP client to verify that everything works uh, with your server end-to-end. -end. So you are verifying your actual server and not some uh, mocked implementation. Mm, you can also use PHP client to do uh, server monitoring to check if everything works with the WebSocket server in production as it should. So if you use something like Pingdom or New Relic or Uptime Robot to check that your application is up and running, uh, these services do not usually support uh, connecting to WebSockets directly because it's quite a new protocol and it's not very usual to use it. So you can provide them an HTTP endpoint, which uh, connects to your WebSocket server using the, uh, the, using the PHP client. And then you can return uh, HTTP code 200 or 500, according if the WebSocket server is up or down. So if the WebSocket server goes down, your script returns HTTP 500, and you have a red alert that something is wrong, even with traditional monitoring services like uh, New Relic. Okay, and uh, last but not least, I promised you how to implement WebSockets in an older browser. So uh, you can still write traditional WebSockets server even if you have to support older browsers. But you also have to provide another server that translates AJAX requests for uh, the older, older browser. So I think it's useful because you don't have to write your main application logic twice, once for the WebSockets and once for the AJAX. You let your client or your clients flow through the main uh, Ratchet WebSocket server, and you also provide some uh, translation layer for all the browsers. So I also implemented this, and it works uh, in a simple way. The older, older Internet Explorer, like Internet Explorer 8 or 7, connects to a long point server with a long AJAX request. And I use that AJAX request to stream changes, to stream events to the older browser. So I read, uh, so I react to a callback, which is called uh, response status changed. And I read what was added to the response, response body. Uh, since the last time the response the response status changed. Okay, so uh, I honestly think that WebSockets are awesome and they are the future. 
uh, because all the updates come to your users automatically and immediately, and it's very efficient technology. Uh, so when you implement WebSockets, your users no longer have to press, press the real button um, to find something new, but uh, everything happens automatically in their browser without them thinking about it. So I hope I inspired you today to make something awesome. Thank you for your attention. Okay, do you have any questions? Um, if I understand correctly, you have uh, one long running process that handles communication with all the users. Um, with that comes a uh, possibility that with um, one re re of requests from one of users uh, breaks the process. You're also losing all of the requests that came from other users in the which not been responded yet to. So how do you handle that? Is that a problem? Yeah. So that's what the reconnecting is for from the client. So where a client connects, you should send him all the current state that he needs and he should throw his local state and read the state from the server every time he connects. So in case your process goes down uh, because of some error or during deployment, or your clients can handle it and read the whole state of your application from the server, like or the recent messages or the current state of the seats and etc. Okay, so you have to implement reconnecting and uh, you should read the state from the server. Okay, anyone else? Uh, could you give us more examples, another than chat, uh, when we can use uh, web sockets? Okay, so uh, Slack uses them. Slack is uh, very popular. So every time uh, you are, every time you are, uh, you want to use Ajax for some pe periodical updates, you can use WebSockets, and it's much more efficient. It's more entertaining. It's it's really cool. <laughs> From my uh, small experience, I've noticed that uh, WebSockets uh, can uh, overload the, pro, uh, the server side, and uh, is not, isn't that uh, an issue? I don't have, uh, I don't know, I don't have that experience. Okay. They don't, they don't overload our servers. <laughs> Okay. So Thanks. it depends on what you did, what you did uh, in your server. Maybe you used some blocking functions, or I don't know. Um, that it was because one of uh, client uh, uh, in our server had opened the uh, web sockets, and probably he s he had uh, a wrong uh, configuration of that. Probably. No, no. <laughs> I don't know if you have uh, opportunity to try, the, for example, the Node.js to implement WebSocket, but I would like to ask you, what do you think, what is the best uh, idea to implement in, in PHP or, the, for example, Node.js with Socket.io or something like this? Because, well, for example, in PHP, you need to load the external libraries to, for example, like, like Ratchet or, and others like to make asynchronous code, yeah? So, well, what do you think about this? Well, if you already have a PHP application and you have PHP developers in your team, I think it's better to reuse PHP because you have everything already settled in PHP. You have coding standards, you have uh, some quality assurance, Every, everyone on your team can read PHP code. So if you already have PHP application, I think uh, you can write your WebSockets in PHP and you will be fine. If you uh, want to learn uh, Node.js and you want to try WebSockets in Node.js, you can, but uh, if you already have everything in PHP, I don't think um, it's necessary to use JavaScript for it. 
Okay. Any more questions? Okay, so that's all. Thank you very much.